So welcome everyone to New South Wales DPI Dairies webinar number 13, Robotic Milking and Grazing from an Irish Perspective. My name is Nicholas Lyons. I am a Development Officer Dairy with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in Australia and a project leader for Milking Edge, a three-year industry project building a training and an extension program for robotic milking in Australia. However, this today is not about me. I would like to introduce Andrew Walsh. Andrew Walsh is our invited speaker with us today. Unfortunately, Jordan Molloy couldn't join us. She had a last minute issue and clash of agenda. So it will be Andrew only today. Um, but Andrew has a wealth of experience with AMS. Andrew and I met in 2015 when I was visiting Ireland and visited his family farm and visited and met James, his father and him. Um, they were one of the first AMS farms in Ireland. They installed a De Laval AMS robot in 2015 in a pasture-based AMS farm. We then met again in 2017 when Andrew came to Australia for a, a conference that De Laval organized in Tasmania, and we shared some of the experience of managing farms and, and what could be achieved on a grazing farm. So he manages a three-way grazing farm since 2015. It's the second farm in the Republic of Ireland. And in the past, he also ran a blog through the That's Farming website. So he, he might be sharing some of that journey with us today. He also recently upgraded the family farm to, to a new De Laval VMS 300. And he's offering consulting services to other AMS farms. So I'm sure he will be able to share some of the insights he's learned through this journey too. Andrew also accepted to be one of our AMS experts in the online AMS community. So I do appreciate Andrew's willingness, not only to share part of his journey with us here today, but also to contribute to some of the initiatives that we are running here. So I'll hand over to Andrew now to take, um, take it on from here. But I again, thank you, Andrew, for joining us here today. Cheers, Nico. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Walsh. And we've been, as Nico asked, five years, along with my father, James. And for the past two years, I have been involved with Delaval, um, giving a, a grazing training service to farmers starting up with AMS. Um, just today, just to give you a rundown of what we're going to go through, I'll be showing you uh, my journey with the AMS and how grass management is so critical to success of the system and the infrastructure, um, the importance of that, and what problems I've come across um, in my journey um, be it on our farm and on other farms around Ireland. Um, so just to give you an idea of where uh, about, about so we're on the southeast coast of Ireland um, in County Wexford, um, we get an average rainfall of about 1.2 metres. Um, so we are able to grow quite a lot of grass. Um, so predominantly we're 90% spring calving and 10% autumn calving. So our land is not as dry as some of the areas in Ireland, but it's not as wet as some of the areas. So we get an average enough uh, grazing season from the 10th of March to the 1st of December. Um, I suppose the reason we went down the road of AMS is our conventional system that we originally had was uh, over capacity and what we weren't able to get the output that we want, just thinking about half hours um, minimum to milk the cows during peak. So we sort of decided that if we're going to stand still, then the only way to go is backwards. So it was either upgrade or it was get out cows, get out dairy. Um, so we decided to go down the road of AMS. Uh, my father and myself decided this that AMS was going to be the right option for us. Uh, it was going to reduce the manual labor and 
also I was returning from university so it was a huge incentive to stay at the farm and keep with the cows so 2015 we started off with our Delaval BMS Classic um, started straight on ABC grazing uh, we only had 55 cows and it was actually the same year that the EU abolished the quotas so our aim at this time was to have, stick with our 55 cows but push them as far as we could and get the most out of them, uh, the most milk out of them. We didn't really realize that the capacity of the eyes was easy. So by May 2018, we actually reached 75 cows on the one robot. Um, it was at its maximum capacity and there was only about 6% idle time, even below that at times. And we're getting about 2,200, 2,300 kilos a day. So that's when we started a decision when Delaval announced the new model, the Delaval VMS V300, and it has the increased cow capacity, a higher output. And we actually at the moment have 75 cows, and we've actually doubled the idle time on the same amount of cows. At the moment, they give about 33 kilos a day. So we're quite happy with the results so far. And we're wondering where, what is the potential of this machine? We're hoping to get to 80 cows this year. So I suppose we'll see from there. Um, just an idea of the success that we have had with AMS so far is in from 2012 to 2014, we only ever had 50 cows and the most milk we put in was 2,220 litres. Um, if you look at 2018, that was last year, we had 75 cows, and we actually put in 510,000 litres. So this blue line is when we started up with the, with the robot, and you can see quite a large trajectory upwards. Um, this is down to general um, successful management that we've had. But while this curve looks quite a, an upward trajectory, the road to get there has probably been anything but. It's been ups and downs and a massive learning curve. So you usually say of a journey of a thousand miles begin with a single step. But for us, if we'd known what direction to take that step, if someone had given us a map, then we would have probably been able to cut out a lot of the trial and error and had a much smoother um, journey. So that's where the likes of myself and other advisors in Ireland um, have come on board and to point these farmers in the right direction and try and cut out some of that uncertainty that they have and reduce the amount of problems that they may incur at the startup. Um, there's a lot of problems that we probably found and went through that a lot of farmers, if we are able to point them in the direction they need to go, they probably don't need to encounter the same problems. So the direction that you generally farmers, if I go out on a farm, is I would say management of grass is the primary um, it is, it is what runs the system. It's, it's, it's the it's the keystone for the whole for the whole system. And without good infrastructure, then you'll get poor cow flow, and this is where it breaks down. And being proactive is really really important with anything, but especially with AMS. Um, so when I talk about managing, the first thing I would say is measure your grass, and generally with the farmers in Ireland anyway. If you say measuring grass, the first thing that comes to your head is a plate meter, clippers, out in the rain, clipping the grass, weighing the grass. But it doesn't have to be as complicated as that. In general, what you wear every day nearly, your wellness and boot is sufficient enough to get even just a rough estimate. And you can allocate your grass from that. And you guys then generally you will have a fairly good perception of what covers you're looking at. 
so poor quality grass, like the one on the left, well, it's not overly poor, but it's quite heavy cover. And that can lead to poor quality cow flow. Um, it breaks down if the cows, if the pasture isn't palatable, then you tend to get a lot of cows not wanting to stay in that field and just wanting to come back. And you get a big traffic jam in the yard and everything breaks down. So I want to uh, allocate uh, grass in three allocations. So you've probably heard of an ABC grazing, which means that each, um, the whole grazing block is divided up into three different blocks. So you have block A, block B, and block C. And then you have, they go from block A in our system to block C. So you can see the different times of the change at. It's all time-based. So when they come from block A, at, uh, for, they go to block A at nine to five. And from five o'clock, the gate will actually change time. So they're actually sent in a different direction completely to block C. The reason we don't go A to B to C is actually because we try to send the cows in as many opposite directions as we can. Um, so our system offers two what they call smart gates. Um, the cows come to the gate and it will either send them in for milk permission, um, as you see here, or it'll send them out to graze uh, depending on the time. Or if they come back early, it will actually return them to where they came from. So for instance, if a cow came from A, um, she comes into this, get into the holding area and uh, just before the gate and she goes into the gate and the gate will decide which direction to send her. And if she has milk permission, she will head straight into the robot and be milked. Once she's milked, she's returned back out to the exit and she's sent into um, this smart gate here. And this smart gate will then decide based on time, which paddock she used to be sent to either A, B or back around here for C and on she goes. Um, so one of the questions actually was that was put to me from Nico was uh, how much grass do you allocate? Um, basically we start this is like a grazing matrix that I'd give a lot of farm and uh, um, just to have an idea in their head and have it see it written down as to where what areas they're going to. So on the left, you can see area A, um, um, B and C, and the different open closing times. I didn't, um, for this example, bother with fetch times, but um, you can see the dry mare allocated for the herd. So in general, this is a for this one, it's a Holstein herd, so uh, 600 kilo cows. Um, they're going to eat about 21 kilos. So we have to divide this 21 kilos up um, throughout the day. So if the cow is getting five kilos in the robot of dairy ration, that'll leave um, 16 kilos left that has to be divided up amongst A, B, and C. Um, you can see here in area C, it's actually it's lower than areas A and B. This is because this is what's known as the night paddock. In general, a cow will eat a lot less um, in the evening, in the night time, so from 10 o'clock um, onwards. Um, so you want the cows to be able to come out of this paddock. Um, otherwise, they'll probably fill up, lie down, and go to sleep. So you want them not hungry, but you want them that they have an incentive to move and go on to the next paddock, which is um, B. Um, so that's the quality of the, uh, how, we, um, how, how we know how much to allocate. Now we need to know um, how to allocate that grass in each area. So on block A, B, or C, um, it's all the same method. Um, so this is just an example here of how we would get that six kilos of dry matter um, per cow 
in that block. So for 100 kilohertz, we're going to need 600 kilo, kilos of dry matter of grass in just for instance, say block A. We have a grass cover of 1200 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So our herd demand is going to be, sorry, our area required is going to be herd demand divided by a grass area, per, grass cover per hectare. So when we worked out, we need 0.5 of a hectare. So it's divided our 500 kilos into our 1200 kilos, and a 0.5 of a hectare. And I bring that into square meters we want, 5,000 square meters. So we know our paddock is 120 meters wide. So we just divide that 120 into the 5,000, and we get, well, we round up, we get 42 meters is what we actually need to be our length of the paddock now. Um, so it's going to be one, uh, 20 by 42. Um, but this is all irrelevant if our grazing infrastructure is not sufficient. So we need a good surface. We need the roadway wide enough for two cows to pass. They don't need to be over wide. The only roadways that we actually need to be um, wide is the ones that you want to drive a tractor down. Um, otherwise, we actually use their what we call spur roadways. So they're only just wide enough for two cows to pass. Um, they can get water on these laneways. So you don't need to in every field. Of small drinkers, uh, well, not small drinkers, medium sized drinkers, we'll say, um, all on the laneway. So we'll have multiple and multiple numbers of these. So they can actually act uh, for multi purpose points. So you can see this drinker on the right will actually serve. I'm where I'm taking the photo is laneway, is the B laneway, and on the other side of that is A laneway. So it's actually serving both A and B. Um, but this is really important and it's generally farmers they are fairly good at and they understand that the surface of the roadway is important and what direction the roadways are going is also important so as i said earlier we want to try to send the cows in opposite directions if we can so when coming from a going to b they want to be complete opposite directions that's why we have a going to c because they are not proactive. Um, so when we talk about being proactive, there's another um, management tool I use. Um, it's all a domino effect. So one um, one management one thing that you do will affect another. So just say in this situation, if the cows all exit from the field at the same time. So say area A. This means there's been under allocation of grass in that paddock. So how do we correct that? Well, they've already exited, so we can't correct it for A. So what we have to do is allocate more grass in B and C, and that will start to bring them back under control, and they won't all want to exit. But having the C, they certainly shouldn't all want to exit at the same time. Another um, situation will be if the cows are not moving at all, then there's been an over allocation. Um, so like we allocated more grass in B and C, then we just allocate less grass in B and C. Um, it's quite simple that if you just sort of take a moment to realize what's happened and use logic to correct that situation. Um, some of the problems that I've come across um, with a AMS, and probably the biggest one um, is the over and under allocation of grass. Generally, this occurs from probably an over over or underestimation of how much grass is actually um, in that paddock. So a farmer might think there's 1,200 kilos of dry matter in it, but really there might be um, 1,500 kilos in it. So it's just having the gauge that grass um, 
I know what you're dealing with to be able to allocate the gas. Um, inconsistent cow flow then, um, really, I suppose this comes from the over and under allocation of grass, um, where you get lulls and then you get a big, um, how would you say, a big group of them coming at the same time, which is not ideally what you want. You want nice consistent flow throughout the day um, so that the robot is not under pressure at certain times of the day uh, compared to others. Um, and ironically, um, in Ireland, because we run uh, January grazing in a lot of farms from February up to December, in our case, March to December, um, but then the rest of the time is indoors. So they spend about 100 to 150 days indoors. Um, the grazing is actually forgotten about. Um, they spend, the farmer is spending so much time getting the sheds ready, getting the robot sorted, getting the robot installed. Um, that they sort of the, put the robot on the long, put the grazing on the wrong finger on the long finger. Um, but they soon realize that the grazing is actually more importantly than um, the sheds or the lay of the robot itself, because they're inside for one third of the year and outside for two thirds. Um, so just by increase in cow flow, you can see here that between the hours of four or five and six, and in general, this is where the biggest problem occurs on farms, where getting cows to flow um, during these times. And what happens is you get, well, generally a steady, uh, a steady uh, flow prior to this time. And then after this time you get a lull and then all of a sudden a big group of cows come and the robot's under pressure to get through these cows because they're so full of milk. Like there might be cows coming with 20, 25 kilos of milk. So you're not really gonna get up to seven milkings. Um, you can see here, if the lull is from four or five, between four or five and six, um, it takes up to 11, 12 o'clock before you're getting over seven milkings before that backlog is anywhere clear. So generally you want um, to be heading for, on the VT100, you can be heading for uh, seven, between seven and eight milkings. And uh, so in the desirable flow, uh, we can see the same period, um, it's filled. So there's cows milking quite consistently throughout the day. And when we take seven milkings an hour and we draw a line across that, we can see there's quite, a lot of the hours of the day have quite a lot of, um, a lot of seven, oh, oh, it's over seven milkings quite regularly compared to when you have this lull, seven milkings um, in a few, in a few uh, hours. So as I said, the lull causes a backlog throughout the day. And if you have this lull, you won't get um, enough, you won't get your 2.3 or 2.4 milkings a day. You'll probably, in this uh, scenario, you'll only be looking at two, maybe 2.1, depending on how many cows you have on the system. If you're wanting to run a high uh, stocking rate, then this is what you have to be um, after. This is inconsistent flow. You will get away with it on a low stock rate, so 50, 55 cows in a robot. But if you want to run your 70, 75, 80 cows, then this ne even needs to be higher and more consistent. Um, when I say that the farmer then puts the grazing on the long finger, um, these are some of the quotes that are nearly unbelievable that I've heard back um, throughout my travel. Um, in Ireland. So what I've heard is a farmer referring to his markets, sure, I'll find a home for them out of the way somewhere. Do I really need those things? Also referring to his markets. Um, and this one, I couldn't, I couldn't believe at the time was, it was the 28th of January. So I was just asking him, so when do you normally start grazing? And the response I got was, first of February 
I suppose I should start thinking, start thinking about this then. Um, it's not really good enough to start thinking of grazing on the first of on the twenty eighth of January when you start on the first of February. Um, you should have been thinking about this on at least the first of January. Um, but as I said, the problem is um, the start up in the spring. Um, in general, sorry, in like in Ireland, a lot of, a lot of startups are in the spring, and the cows are inside. So it's all focused on sheds, and not that they don't want to know about the grazing completely, but at the time, it's probably the weather isn't great. Um, they don't really want to be planning their grazing system outside when they're trying to plan what's going on inside and trying to maybe even start up. They might be starting up inside. So grazing is sort of nearly takes bottom priority. And then the farmer gets a severe shock when they realize, oh, I actually have to go grazing with my cows. How do I do that? So what we actually do um, for the last year is we give a farmer a visit uh, six weeks prior to startup. This is to cut out these sort of comments um, that they actually are starting to think about grazing. And we run through a whole program. And then once they started up, we visit again to ensure that they're actually following what we are putting in place for them. So giving them their map. And then we do another follow-up um, just to see what can be fine-tuned and still again, ensure that they're not having um, issues that we've talked about before and that everything is running smoothly enough with them. Um, so yeah, this is what uh, generally, these nice big sheds in Ireland, they're a common site. Um, but this is more of a common site. So this grazing is really what the focus should be on and less so on this. But that's just my opinion. Um, so just to conclude, um, what we talked about today is that AMS can increase production quite rapidly if ma if the grass management is correct. Um, being proactive is really, really important for the system to work. So uh, identify a potential problem that's going to happen and correct it before it happens. And then consistency comes probably with being proactive and the grass management. So it all goes hand in hand. And as I said, it's all a domino effect. So what one action does lead to a reaction in another scenario. And AMS can really be successful with grazing um, if the management is right and if the farmer's thinking is correct. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, then I'd gladly like to hear them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, fantastic presentation not only the way you delivered it, but also the content covered through the webinar. So thank you very much for pulling it together and and definitely achieve one of the things that we were discussing um, while we were organizing this. So yeah, th there were a couple of questions that came through. Um, I'll just start pulling them up as we go. One, the first one is... Let me put it up. The first one is... Um, how do you know how many cows are in each block and if you monitor this? And do you ever change gate times to achieve a certain amount of cows arriving at each block? Uh, yeah, um, basically in Delpro, which is the uh, software that Delaval used um, for cow management, um, there are reports um, that show you all the cow locations. So it'll actually tell you how many cows and what cows are in A, B, and C. So for instance, if we saw that there was um, not that many cows got to area A, if they're coming from B, then we might adjust 
the time by maybe even an hour um, to allow more cows to get there. So an hour of milking is probably eight more cows. And obviously, if you had multiple robots, so it's going to be 16 more cows, so, so on, so on. So let's be more cows get there before um, going on to the next paddock. Otherwise, sometimes that paddock might not actually be grazed out, so the cover might still be quite high, and those cows will leave anyway. So yeah, we would change the times um, occasionally if there wasn't enough cows got to that area. So, so that means that throughout the year you don't change K times? Like normally they're set to that um, 9, 5, gen- and 1? Generally, generally not, no. We would, uh, we would generally just keep the same, the same time throughout the year. Uh, even for daylight savings, we would just let the cows adapt. Excellent. There's some comments that I've heard from some farmers that one of the advantages of changing gate times is that you kind of break that habit of the cows learning the gate time changes and, and expecting them or waiting them. What would be your thought there? Um, yeah, no, like a lot of farmers do spend a lot of time changing the gate, but uh, to be honest, I just like we, we would have been doing that for maybe the first couple of years, but we realized there's no advantage in production um, by doing that. And cows are creatures of habit, so you'd have you'd be driven around in a bend if you spend every day, every week changing gate times. They're going to learn no matter what. Like you know, it doesn't take them very long. They learn quicker than we learn nearly. So I just like to leave them in their habit, and if that's what they do, it's okay. I adjust their habit by giving them the allocation of grass. So rather than all the cows coming up, I just give them more grass. Um, generally, more grass means um, that when a cow leaves that paddock, the other cows aren't too bothered because they still have feed in that paddock. So um, yeah, I, I just leave the gate pa- gates as they are, but um, I know some farmers do change them quite regularly. Excellent. Then there's another question of somebody says, hi Andrew, great presentation. You obviously made huge changes to the farm when you changed your system. What was your starting point and what made you decide on this system? So you, you covered a bit of it at the beginning, but if you had to say what yeah. were three main things that made you and your family think about this um i suppose the first one was that as i said we were sort of running not old old system but it just wasn't able to uh keep up with our output so we were sort of stuck around the 50 cows and 50 cows taking two and a half hours wasn't really viable so we had to upgrade to something it was either going to be an upgrade to parlor or uh a robot and the second reason, um, probably just as important, was at the time I was away, I was still in um, university, and my dad actually had uh, a back back surgery, so he wasn't able to milk cows anymore. So if I was to return home to the farm like I did, then I would have to milk those cows or get in relief milk. Um, and when we did the cost, it was actually cheaper to have a robot than hiring a relief milker for the for the entire year and i sure is i i sure didn't want to uh be stuck milking cows when returning from uh university and i suppose the third reason was um to as I said, we wanted to, we didn't know we'd be able to get to 75 cows on the robot, but with our 55, maybe 60, um, we wanted to maximize the production of those cows. So we were looking at getting the, the genetic potential out of the cows. So we were willing to feed the cows more and we thought by having more visits, um, the cows would give more. So there's the three reasons is, um, up, we had to upgrade. Um, I was going to be stuck milking the cows as my dad couldn't milk them anymore, um, or I had to get in labour. Um, and the next one was we want to increase our production. Excellent. Well, was was the the fact that you adopted robot a higher incentive for you to stay on the farm? Uh, sorry. What was the fact that you had a robot on the farm a higher incentive 
to stay on um, the farm? Yeah, it was it was a much much greater incentive to stay on the farm. Um because like I I'm quite a I like technology. Um and I'd always like to do if I could do a job with technology, so like milking, I would take it any day over um actually have to get out and do like use a milking machine like having to do it uh, manually when there is technology there to do it automatically uh while the technology is there i always think like why not avail of it why not use it um because someone else is <laughs> yeah and the other thing andrew is that you showed a graph that one that had the times on the horizontal axis and the production on the vertical axis and how you increase production. Um, and that is due to cow numbers and production per cow. Did, like, did you see an increase in production per cow and roughly of how much while going to robot? Uh, yeah, we did actually quite an increase in production. Um, I know that our meal feeding probably doubled, but um, as I said, we were under EU quotas there. So the most we were ever feeding was um, about 600 kilos per cow. And now we're feeding 1,200 kilos per cow. But we've seen a production increase from around 4,700 litre cows up to now we're averaging 7,000 litres per cow. Yeah, that's quite, quite a dramatic um, yeah, increase in production. <laughs> it's, yeah, we're, we're, we're at the moment now we're, we're happy uh, with how they've increased, but we still think there's with the right genetics and right breeding, there's probably a bit more left in them. Yeah. There's another question, Andrew, that says, how does grazing work with backlogs in the morning when using the shed and a small block outside for paddock C? This is a farmer, obviously. We have cows still in the shed at 11 o'clock in the morning when cows can leave the shed at 6 o'clock in the morning. So you have cows start returning before they have all passed through the robot. Um, yeah, generally with high stocking, high, highly stocked uh, robots, you'll probably get a bit of an overlap there. Um, I suppose really the ones returning in the morning then are probably coming back maybe a little bit too soon. Um, you could push them out if you wanted another hour to not let them, they're probably just coming back because they know they're going to get fresh grass. So you could push them back another hour um, and maybe let them on later until that backlog is cleared out or even more of it cleared out. Yeah, so so I guess it's it's that kind of in the same line with the proactivity and, and adapting to, to cow traffic and, and their locations. Um, the other one was around... Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you had a spring calving of 90%, roughly. Has moving yeah. to robots changed your calving pattern and your breeding criteria? Um, to answer, I suppose, um, the simple answer is yes, that we would never have been uh, autumn calving before. All our calving would have, would have happened in uh, from March until sorry, from February until April. Um, but I suppose the other part of that was that we did all this, we started up a robot the same year the quotas went. So it doesn't really matter now. You can just try to produce as much milk as you can. Um, obviously at as low a cost as you can. But if you have a robot, there's no point in having it idle. And that was our thinking is you might as well have it doing something, at least, like during the months of December, um, when we have our few autumn calvers or our late cap spring calvers, um, we'll generally milk them on. So in December, we might even just have 30, 40 cows milking. But at least it's producing some sort of output, it's having some sort of income and making repayments where it doesn't do any of that it was sitting idle so in that sense we have slightly altered our not altered our calving pattern but if a cow doesn't have from february until april 
um, we have no problem keeping that cow and milking her on if she's giving enough milk and calving her um, from August until October. Yeah, and we've seen that in, on other farms too. And, and I agree with you on the fact of maximizing the utilization of the robot and how much milk you can get. Um, from the KPI project that we run currently, but we've also done in the past, we saw that farmers could on average increase by 60% the amount of milk harvested per robot if f- fully utilized. So so I think the potential is definitely out there um, for those farmers that want to maximize it. And we have an article coming out in the newsletter at the end of April that targets exactly exactly that. There's another comment um, of somebody, and you might have picked uh, a consulting job here. It says, how do I get you to come to my farm in Shropshire, England, to implement your wisdom? I've been grazing for four <laughs> years and always seems a faff and harder than winter housing. So so I guess probably aside from, from that comment is, what do you find is the, is the toughest thing with grazing? Is it managing grazing per se? So the same could be applied for conventional milking. Is the fact of understanding the three-way grazing and the voluntary nature, or or is the kind of manipulating allocation for cow flow? Like, where do you see farmers struggling to get to get their head around? Um, probably the biggest problem is um, that herd mentality, trying to get the cows to travel uh, more individually. Um, it can be quite a challenge, especially during um, periods of weather that is quite poor. So a lot of heavy rainfall, um, like we had last night here. Um, a lot of cows, they generally try to huddle. Um, so they all want to be like one big herd. And trying to sort of break that is, is a challenge. And especially um, when you're starting off, you're trying to get the cows to come individually. And then after a while, um, you see the cows, rather than you trying to get them to come, you're trying to get them to actually stay in the paddock because they all, when they see one move, a lot of them want, they all want to come. But um, that's where you sort of need to, um, when you're starting up, send your cows in different directions, but make sure we actually have settings in the gates now that ensures that even if all the cows decided to come up from the field or half of them up from the field together, they can't all end up in the same block. So you want cows in block A and block B or block B and block C. So you want cows in two blocks at the same time. So even if that's uh, 90% of the cows in one block and like 10% in another block or 5% in another block and 5% in milk, um, that's ideally what you want. So I'd say breaking that herd mentality is probably the toughest challenge um, to AMS on a grazing system. When you're on an indoor system, it's not really the same problem because um, they're all sort of in their cubicles and they can come and go. They're they're more consistent in their flow and the feed is of the fence. They come, they eat, they lie down, they milk. It's just the same every day. When you're on grazing, they have to walk different distances. They have to go to all these different blocks, and it can be quite challenging. And you just have to get your head around it. Excellent. Um, there's another kind of question, but you answered it in the presentation. Is your pasture allocation tables showed 15 kilograms of grass in ABC? How much meal is allocated in the robot? And I think you mentioned five kilos in the robot per cow. At least in the example. Yeah, well, it's on a uh, that was just an average, but it's on a feed yield basis. So the more they give, uh, the more milk they give, the more feed they'll get. And the, the cows are not giving as much milk to get. Uh, uh, won't get as much meal in the robot. Yep. Then there's another question: Do you mind if cows skip a paddock during the day? Do you allow access to cubicles at all? And do you buffer feed at all? Um, that's actually a question that I always get asked um, every time I go to a farm is, or even after I've started up, is saying, oh, all my cows, they won't all go to A and they won't all go to B and they won't all go to C. Well, that actually means that the system is actually working quite well, where they're not all going to all the blocks. 
like I as I said, you want the cows in two blocks. So the last one, just for instance, say they're going A, B, C, they're going from A to B, and the last ones, the cows, yeah, sorry, the cows are coming from A. The last, the last of them want to be coming when the cows are going on to C. So technically, you nearly want them in not in three paddocks, but by the end, by the end of the day, or by the end of the time period in A, sorry, in B, you want the last of the cows to come from A. So these cows will actually not go to B; they'll come from A and go to C. They go to sorry, B milk and then go to C. So I generally don't want all my cows to go, all of them go to A, all of them go to B, and all of them go to C. Yeah, and, and I, when, when I was doing my PhD, I was looking at grazing allocations and numbers, and we found exactly that. The fact that you provide more allocations within a 24-hour, and some farms in Australia are offering four allocations, for example, in a day, is just to yep. provide more opportunity for cows to traffic and spread out that traffic throughout the day. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that every cow will get to every paddock. No. Quite the opposite. In some farms, we've seen that by slowing cows down, if you want to call it, not having all the cows milk necessarily three times a day, you increase production because you don't make cows walk more than what they should. Yeah. If a cow is not going to give any more by milking three times a day, then there's no point in milking it three times a day in, in my mind. Yeah, no, and I, and I 100% agree with you. Do you find it harder to get cows and calf, Andrew? Um, do you have any figures of empty rates or conception pregnancy? Um, I suppose the robot really doesn't have any bearing on, uh, pr- directly anyway, to uh, reproduction. The reproduction, we, I, I, we've always said, is down to your diet and how you control your body condition score. Um, of your cows throughout the lactation, especially during uh, dry up and after calving and transition periods. Um, we actually had the BCF camera installed after the robot, and this has actually increased our uh, our ability to get cows and calves we found, that we actually won't inseminate a cow unless she is gaining her in body condition score. If she's dropping body condition score, she's probably a 30% uh, conception rate. If she's gaining, she probably has close to an 80, maybe 90, um, if her diet is right at the time. Um, so we found last year, I think we had in a spring calves was I think a 5% empty rate. So it's quite low. And some of those cows anyway were um, on the coal list. Um, and next year we actually have two, we'll actually have uh, too many heifers. So we'll have to sort of look at options either selling heifers or uh, look at getting rid of some of the, as we call, passengers in the herd. But um, so too many heifers is probably a sign that a lot of cows have gone in calf. So we have enough replacements and um, we also have enough cows in the system at the moment. So um, yeah, conception rates are quite good and our reproduction um, has been good um, over the last few years, but I wouldn't put it down directly to uh, the robot um, itself. Yeah, and, and I guess it's that fact that the, the, the robot is only a component of the system, the rest or, or the results come down to, to a lot of the management input. Um, yeah, exactly. One, one of the last questions is, once you go out to grazing from the barn, do you give them access to the barn? Um, so we are in that transition period in the spring. Is that what that sort of means? Um, so we go from uh, the indoors to grazing. Is that is that what the question is? I guess part of the question is: Do you either like at certain times of the year you graze, and at certain times of the year you're in the barn, or is there any time of the year that cows have access to both the barn and grazing? Um, yeah, like generally when we start up in the spring, so in March, um, if we just have the calving, uh, we like to transition them so they've been on a full silage and uh, grass silage and maybe fodder beet and certain elements. Um, that's our diet 
for maybe 100 days. Um, it'd be quite a shock to their system, uh, to the rumen, if we were just to let them directly on the grass and cut out uh, the feeds in the shed. So what we tend to do is buffer feed them for, well, we're still actually, but we let them out in February this year, we're still actually buffer feeding them. So when they come, the way we work it is, uh, in the morning, I'll put out the feed at the feed fence, and when the cows come back from the paddock to be milked, um, they enter the shed and they can eat their um, whatever they want to eat of the buffer. So it's a sort of ad lib nearly, and then they can be milked and then they go on the pasture. Um, so what does we find though, the problem with that is, so we sort of set up the system, not with a buffer feed in mind. So um, it still works, it, it works. But the problem is we find if they do eat too much, at the feed fence and they fill up there, they're probably not um, as willing to go into the robot. But if there's no feed at the feed fence, we had to find uh, traffic, cow traffic can be a lot better because they're more willing there, they have an incentive to go through the robot and go find their feed, which is the grass. Yeah, I know that's a good point. And then somebody was asking about the buffer feed, so that's. That's a good comment. Probably that the last question, Andrew, is what would you do different if you had to start again? Like you, you've been four years doing it. Uh, what would you do differently? And kind of match with that is what would you recommend a farmer that is looking into AMS as an option to consider? Um, well, the first thing I would have done differently is built our facilities for probably 80 or 90 cows. We only built them for about 60 cows, so it can... Uh, pose a few problems if we have to bring in all the cows at the moment. But um, thank you for thinking the, the generally our weather in the summer um, until December is not bad enough to have to bring them all in. But um, that's where spring calving systems so can be quite beneficial where you don't need massive uh, housing facilities for all your cows. Um, in terms of the actual layout or grazing, it's not probably a whole lot of do different. It seems uh, like if the cows are working, the cows are flowing, the cows are milking, and the production is quite good and has increased quite a lot since we put in the robot, then there's obviously something working. Um, maybe the only thing it would have done different is considered um, putting in a second robot. Um, yeah, at the moment, we changed our robot, so which upgraded to the new model. So um, maybe in the future, we could put in a second one of the new models right now. So maybe in a position to do that um, in a few years time. Excellent. And, and the last question, from, maybe from my side, more from the interest of technology is, you said you've got an interest in technology. What, what other technologies have you been kind of playing around with that you think are, are can go with AMS very well? Like, is there anything in... In the scene, you mentioned the body condition score camera, but is there anything else? Either can be reproduction, feeding, grass, water, whatever. Like, is there anything that you've been tossing around that could be suitable for AMS? Um, that has it's something that hasn't been uh, implemented into AMS. Or yeah, or something that you, have... that you that you have seen or that you have dealt with technology-wise that you think is worth matching with AMS? Um, poor. I suppose actually one of the things is uh, they be GPS on the cows. We're able to actually, I know they have them for barn systems, but if you're able to actually uh, track a cow's um, actual pathways and her movement in the field, not just her activity, but her actual where she goes and what she's doing, you probably have a better idea of her behavior and you can probably manipulate this behavior to um, try and get the cows to flow maybe a bit better sometimes. So if you see, it's probably more individual based rather than group based. So an individual cow, um, if she used to walk quite a long distance, if you were able to look and see uh, what was her path and if she, you can really interpret, is she is she happy to walk that distance or is it too far of a distance for her? 
Excellent. So, and some groups here in Australia are working with those GPSs, so it would be interesting to see how that technology develops and, and what are we capable to, to, to do with that. With that, Andrew, I, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll try to stick to time because I could stay here forever. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for your time and your insights. Um, once again, thank you for all the support you, you give me and my initiatives and my crazy ideas that I have along <laughs> the journey. Um, and you're always welcome down under whenever you have a minute. It's far away, but, but if you ever get back here, uh, it would be great to have you again sharing some of these insights. So thank you oh. a lot very much and, and say hi to your father, James, on my behalf. I will do. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been no. a pleasure. <laughs> no worries. So thank you, all of you that joined um, to this webinar. Our next webinar is going to be held on May the 29th with Abby Rose. So Abby works for a Lely Center in the U.S., and she'll be sharing her experience work, working with both farmers and consultants around startups, um, but also around the data management and the finance of, of the robots. So um, I'll share the registration link when I share the recording of this webinar with you. But also, if you look at our initiatives, both of Facebook and the newsletter, you'll find more details there. Um, just a, a bit of a blurb of what we are doing. Uh, I'm the project leader for Milking Edge. Milking Edge is an Australian AMS project supported by Dairy Australia, New South Wales DPI, and De Laval that is um, building a support program for industry to consider, invest, and operate AMS successfully. So we generate a lot of tools and resources for farmers and industry. We are heavily involved in regional engagement, and we are building a training package on AMS for farmers and service providers. So please follow our initiatives to learn more about what we are doing. Some of the things that we are involved in where you can hear more about us is our Facebook page, New South Wales DBI Dairy, an online AMS community that sits on the Extension OS platform and where Andrew is one of the AMS experts. So any question that you have about AMS, you can funnel it through there. And there's a group of around 25 experts in the background that collaborate to, to tackle those questions that you can raise. So feel free to have a look and explore and raise your questions through there. And the other one is our New South Wales DPI Dairy AMS newsletter that goes out four times a year. The next one comes out um, at the end of April. So please subscribe to that newsletter to receive news and updates. So once again, thank you very much, all of you, for joining. Um, follow our website for more information. And thank you very much and hope to see you next time.